We have found an x value that makes the sum of two numbers as small as possible, creating this minimum. The, the problem is those two numbers are kind of hidden within that statement. The x value 6 is one of the numbers, and the other number is actually 6. So our answer should reflect what those two numbers are and what really we found. You could say something like this. Of all pairs of numbers with a product of 36, that's like the condition, 6 and 6 have the smallest sum. And that's just saying that we've actually found the two numbers that work. This is also something we can check really easily in your head. In fact, maybe you could have done the whole thing that way. If you think about other numbers that multiply to 36, 9 and 4 come to mind. 9 plus 4 is 13, which is more than 6 plus 6. Or 36 is also 12 times 3, but 12 times 3 is 15, which is even larger. And you can see that we really have found it. Now, being able to do it in your head like that is a great way to confirm that your answer makes sense. And that's what the last step in the strategy is saying when it says interpret your answer. It is not a substitute for knowing how to do the math, because ultimately we're not just talking about pairs of numbers here. We're going to end up talking about marginal cost, marginal revenue, stuff that you can't just calculate really quickly. Before we move on to those examples, I want to make sure that you've internalized how we set these problems up. Do refer back to the strategy if you need to. Look at the one that says for you. Start out, set up your page, and I want you to tell me what are we trying to find, what's the goal, and what are we given. Right, once again we're trying to find two numbers, and our goal is to maximize the product. Remember, product means multiplication problem. We're given that the sum is 20, and so I've chosen x and y to indicate my two numbers. What's the next step? How do we start our work? Exactly, we always start by trying to create a function whose output is the thing we're trying to maximize. Now, I've got the start of a function because I know product means x times y. The problem is I still need to find a different way of writing this that only has one variable. What am I going to use to do that? Yep, we're just going to use the given information. And then I'm going to, when I rearrange that for y, I'm going to substitute what I get in for the y variable, which gives me this really nice function. I have a function whose output is the product and whose input is one of the two numbers, which obviously at the end I'm going to use to find both numbers. What's next? Yep, we would want to find the critical points or endpoints. There are no conditions about the two numbers, so we don't have endpoints, but you should remember that critical points are when the first derivative equals zero, and we're going to solve for those. And that turns, to, turns out to be pretty easy mathematically. We end up with one solution, x equals 10. What's next? Exactly, we still need to prove that this is actually what's going to maximize the product. Now, when we think about maximizing the product, remember we're talking about two different numbers. So eventually we're going to have to figure out what the second number is. You could do it at the end, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now just to make sure that we understand what we're working with. So if x is 10, what does the second number have to be? We're calling it y, but it's not the output of the function. The second number has to be? Yeah, it has to be 10 as well. So if our two numbers are 10 and 10, their product, what we're trying to maximize, is going to be 100. We can just do a really quick common sense check. Can you think of another two numbers that add up to 20? Yeah, we could say like 18 plus 2. Well, if I multiply them together 18 times 2, I get 36. Sure enough, 36 is less than 100. So it's looking pretty good for me. Now, that's good enough to convince me that I'm on the right track. Imagine the seminar where we kind of have to make that judgment, should I keep going? This is a great reason to keep going, but it's not proof. You do still need to prove it. How do I prove that these actually create a maximum? Yeah, first or second derivative test. I'll do second derivative test this time just in case anybody wants to see it. Now when you write things out like this, just a word of warning, remember these are the two numbers. This isn't the output of the function. This actually has nothing to do with my critical point. That's when I interpret the actual problem. So the critical point is 10 and then the output is going to be 100 in the original function, this one up here. 
When I check for maximum and using the second derivative test, once you've already found the critical points, first thing you need to do is actually calculate the second derivative. In this case, the second derivative equals negative 2, like as a function. What does that mean about my original graph? Exactly, it means it's concave down. Now, normally what we would do is we would plug in the x value of the critical point into the second derivative. In this case, that's kind of a silly thing to do because the second derivative always equals negative 2. But in a, in a case where you had variables here, you would plug in the critical point, And then you would look at your answer. And it, if the function's concave down at that x value, then it must have a maximum. And so that's how you mathematically prove that, yes, x equals 10 is the maximum value. All we need to do now is just write out our answer. And we'd most likely say something like, of all pairs of numbers whose sum is 20, 10 and 10 have the largest product. Not so bad. Notice how much more quickly that second example went than the first one. We'll do one more, and then we'll um, call it good for this video. But I want to introduce you to um, a really important technique that you will be using a lot when we start integrals. Example 2 says a rectangle is to be inscribed under one arc of the cosine curve. What is the largest area the rectangle can have? First of all, how do you know this is an optimization problem? Yeah, it, the key is when it says largest area. We're trying to make the area as big as possible. We're trying to maximize the area. And that's why it's an optimization problem, because we're trying to find that ideal circumstance. Now, you can see the diagram below. Um, and this word inscribed is that, is that concept that we're going to be, well, it's a technique that we're going to be doing a lot. Do you know what inscribed means? So look at the word here. Scribe in the middle. A scribe is someone who writes things down. And then there's an in. So what we're doing is we're writing something down inside something else. Look at the the diagram. This red line is supposed to represent the cosine function. You all know that it hits the y-axis up at 1. And underneath of it, or inside of the curve, we've got a rectangle. And the rectangle is limited by the curve outside of it, because it has to be inside. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the only rectangle we could inscribe. We could draw a different rectangle that's kind of skinny like this that would also be inscribed. Or we could draw a really flat one. If we imagine drawing a rectangle that comes up out here and then goes across and goes down to the bottom. All of those are rectangles inscribed beneath this curve. And you can imagine a lot more possibilities. We're wondering, what's the largest possibility that still fits under the curve? So let's go ahead and set it up. Can you tell me what we're trying to find, what the goal is, and tell me one thing that we're given? Right, so hopefully you recognize that our actual answer is going to be an area. What is the largest area? They're just, we're going to say how big the area is. Our goal in order, before finding that area is to maximize it. And what we're given really is the diagram, which they actually could have just described to you. And once you get used to this word inscribed, you should be able to draw the diagram they describe when they say that. But what we know primarily is that this red curve is the function f of x equals cosine. And we know that the rectangle has to be underneath that curve. What that means is actually something even more useful. It means that the corners of the rectangle are going to touch the curve, right? We want it, the rectangle to be as big as possible, so it's going to scooch right up along that line. So the coordinate points, which ultimately are going to help us figure out its area, have to be on the curve of cosine. Now, if you're anything like me, you still don't necessarily see how we're going to write the function. That's OK. We're just going to start with what we can. When we set up an optimization problem, what do we start with? Yeah, we always start by trying to write a function for the thing that we're maximizing. In this case, it's area. Now, what do you know about the area of a rectangle? Sure, the area of a rectangle is base times height. Is this the formula that we can use to do our derivative and optimization? No, because we need a formula that really only has one variable. Right now, we have two variables, a b and an h. So I'm going to try and replace b and h to try and get them in terms of some other variable, or at least in terms of each other. Look at the diagram here. 
the width of the rectangle, whatever it is, is related to the x-coordinate of the corner points. Here's how. Um, we've got the axis. We know that this curve is symmetrical. So we know whatever this point is, this point over here has the same y value and it has the opposite x value. In this diagram, they're calling it z, the distance from the origin to this point. And so if that is z right there, what's the width of the rectangle? It's 2z. Another way to put this is if you know what the x-coordinate of this point is, you know that the width of the rectangle is 2 times that number. So my idea is to try and use that amount as a variable and to try and make an expression for the width, for the base and the height, using that amount. It's going to be helpful to me to actually draw a diagram on paper so that I can label what I'm talking about. This point right here has some x-coordinate. And because I know that this curved line is the cosine of x function, I know that the y value of this coordinate is cosine of x. If I know what the x-coordinate is, I just plug it into cosine and I'll figure out the y-coordinate. Now, what does the y-coordinate of this point really tell us? Exactly. It tells us the height of that line. And guess what? The height of that line is the same thing as the height of this function. So using this diagram, I've just realized that I can write both base and height in terms of x. The height is cosine of x because it's the height of that point. And the base is 2 times x because this is x right here, and these two points, I know it doesn't look like it in my picture, but they have to be equally distant because the cosine function is symmetric. So the distance here is x, and this must be another x, which means the whole base is 2x. And that's the only difficult thing about this problem because now I can finish up my expression. And I end up with a function for area in terms of one variable, which is x, and that function is 2x times cosine of x. The rest is the same as the last couple examples. Our first step is going to be to look for endpoints. Now, are there any rules about area that we should factor in? Are there any rules about what x can or can't be in this case? Sure. One thing is the way that we've drawn our diagram, x can't be a negative number. So one endpoint would just be the number 0. And there are outer limits, like if the rectangle is going to be inside of the curve, the biggest that x can be is 1, because the curve ends right there. So I take those two endpoints, and I'm going to plug them into my original function. And I find out that if x equals 0, then obviously the area is 0. That's probably not going to be my maximum area. And if x is 1, the area is going to be 2. Um, if there are no critical points, then 2 would be your maximum, and that would be it. But there are critical points, so let's go and find them. So we'll set the first derivative equal to 0. And so when we set up the derivative, we end up with this equation. And this equation is actually kind of messy looking compared to what we've been doing. So I'm going to rely on my graphing calculator to help solve this equation. To do that, you just want to type the equation into y equals and then you want to graph it, and you probably are going to need to adjust your window. Sometimes with trig functions, um, I like to try the zoom trig option. It doesn't always work great, but it's a good place to start. And this seems like an OK window. I can certainly see the function better. And then I'm going to use the calculator to find the zero. But what you should notice is that there's a lot of zeros, so we need to know which one we want. Remember what we said about endpoints? We said that we were only interested in values of x that were between zero and one, because that would be inside this first loop of the cosine function. So between zero and one, it looks like this right here is the zero that I'm looking for, and I don't care about the other ones. To find that actual zero, I go second calc, and then I calculate 0, which is option 2. And then I have to mark a left bound and a right bound. And then the calculator thinks for a second. And we end up with an answer of 0 
Normally, we would go on to checking that that's a maximum and then plugging back in to find the area to write our final answer. I'm out of time in this video, so I'm going to end here for today. See you in class.